The Night Beat starts right now. Hurricane Laura sending an increase in evacuees to San Antonio tonight. The storm strengthening in the Gulf. We have team coverage from the response here at home and those near the Texas Louisiana border. Plus. I told him I'm going to let you rest, baby, but mommy's angry like I'm angry. A West Side shooting leaves one man dead and his mother angry. While there was an arrest, this mother believes there is more to this story. But first. We begin with a developing story tonight. Several tasers deployed, but in the end, shots were fired and one person is now dead. Three deputies responding to a home near Liberty Field and Bar Hill Post over on the west side of the county. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar says there seemed to be a mental health issue with a man in his uh, believed to be in his 30 who was armed. Uh, Salazar says his deputies spoke with the man for about 30 minutes. But instead of the man following through, deputies were forced to deploy a taser, but apparently it did not work. And another taser was then deployed. Investigators say the man reached for his weapon when he was shot twice. That man dying at the scene An investigation now underway. Let's turn now to the tropics. Hurricane Laura sending some evacuees here to San Antonio. This as the storm approaches the Texas coast. This is a live look from Galveston tonight. Meanwhile, Governor Greg Abbott directed TxDOT today to waive all tolls on Houston area toll roads to help with evacuations. As we mentioned, we have team coverage tonight. Meteorologist Justin Horn is between Galveston and Port Arthur at High Islands as Laura churns away in the Gulf there. And our Tiffany Huertas uh, with preparations here at home where emergency crews are juggling the response to Laura and an ongoing pandemic. Hundreds of evacuees set to come to San Antonio to seek shelter. Our crews today saw people arriving at that evacuee processing center on Gimbler Road throughout the evening. The night team's Tiffany Huertas is live at the center where evacuees are checking in tonight. And Tiffany, earlier we heard about 50 people were expected there, but there's been a significant increase. That's right. A spokesperson for the San Antonio Fire Department says they are expecting about 300 people to arrive by the end of tonight. But just take a look. There's so many people. There's this bus right here that is just waiting outside because this location is just completely filled. Buses and vehicles with evacuees. We spoke to several people, including a woman from Port Arthur who has experienced this before. She evacuated for Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Imelda. We, you know, it's greatly needed. We really need somewhere to stay. It's people who, you know, haven't got paychecks, who had to leave jobs, who doesn't have funds, you know, and I'm one of, you know, we need help, you know, with assistance just to find somewhere to stay. That's just one of many stories, but just take a look at this again. More than 230 people are arriving on buses and the rest in their own vehicles, all filled with people fleeing Hurricane Laura. There will be uh, a lot of devastation wrecked upon Texas as the storm sweeps through, especially East Texas. Several evacuations have been issued, including Jasper County, Jefferson County, Newton County, Orange County, uh, the city of Galveston, and the city of Port Arthur. There are several evacuation sites across the state, including in San Antonio. Dozens of evacuees have already checked in at this site in the 200 block of Gembler Road. The parking lot was turned into a site where all displaced residents and evacuees could go before heading to the shelter locations. We have shelter available mostly in hotels. Uh, there is a welcome area to assess people coming in to see if there's any medical assistance needed. Earlier today, San Pedro Manor, a nursing home facility near San Antonio College, received 57 evacuees from a sister nursing home in Galveston. Reporting from the east side, Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. And here's the very latest on Category 1 Hurricane Laura. It has strengthened a little bit tonight uh, compared to what we had earlier today in terms of the information. Now maximum sustained winds at 90 miles per hour with some gusts up to 115. Central pressure 978 millibars. This is tracking to the west northwest, likely to become a Category 3 by Wednesday evening at around 7 p.m., give or take, with winds of around 120 miles per hour. That'll be close to the center of the storm. Then it would make landfall late Wednesday night into the early morning hours 
on Thursday as a category three storm and most likely somewhere right near the Texas in Louisiana state line right along the coast in that area with it those 120 maybe even higher winds around the center of that storm. Now our own Justin Horn is at High Island and Justin that's an area that got hit hard by Ike many years ago. Uh, how do you think they'll fare this time around? Yeah, that was back in 2008, Adam, and they had a storm surge of about 20 feet. It caused a ton of damage here. In fact, this cross here behind me was erected to memorialize those who lost their life during Hurricane Ike. Uh, again, this area was hit very hard. Tomorrow, storm surge probably around seven feet here or so, which is still significant. And there is a voluntary evacuation here on High Island, and most people are heeding that warning and going to higher ground. Now, as you mentioned, the bigger impacts are going to be farther up the Texas coast where uh, we can see a storm surge up around 13 feet. That's going to do a ton of damage, uh, especially uh, upper Texas coast and western parts of Louisiana. And that's where winds could get really strong as well, as you mentioned, Adam. Uh, coming up tomorrow, we're going to be moving over to Beaumont and we're going to uh, continue to bring you the latest as Hurricane Laura does make landfall. And we'll let you know what impacts she brings. Again, that'll be tomorrow night and into the uh, early morning hours there on Thursday. Adam, back to you guys. All right, Justin, you and photojournalist Billy Caldera, you guys stay safe out there. Thanks for your coverage. Meanwhile, a reminder, the Red Cross is in need of volunteers tonight. Our KSAC community partners are teaming up with the Red Cross to get the word out. The Red Cross currently looking for upwards of 160 volunteers. If you'd like to volunteer, you can fill out an application online. We have all that information for you right now on ksaccommunity.com. He was a talented basketball player with dreams of making it big, but Isaiah Rioja's life was cut short after police say he was shot while in a car with several of his friends on the city's west side. The night team's Jaffany Gray spoke with his mother, who believes there is more to this story. I get a call at close to midnight that my son was shot, and I was just like, which, what son? You know, I have three boys, and... They just hung up on me. An out of the blue phone call has left Guadalupe Castro with many questions, mainly for this man, 19 year old Jaime Riojas, accused of killing her son, 20 year old Isaiah Riojas. I forgive him, I forgive him, but I wanna ask him why. Why, why did you do that to my son? Why not get help for him if it was an accident? Why not drive him to the hospital? San Antonio police say on the night of August 15th, Isaiah was in the car with several of his friends, including Jaime. Police say those friends were playing with a gun when it went off, hitting Isaiah in the back. He died at the scene while some suspects ran off and some stayed. I told him I'm gonna let you rest, baby, but mommy's angry, like I'm angry. Isaiah was cremated Sunday. He was known as... Everybody just stayed easy, easy, easy. So. And he grew up and that was his name, Easy. And he was also known as a baller playing alongside his brother, Brandon. I mean, he played all over the United States, traveled with a lot of teams that he played with, small kids that would look up to him in basketball and things like that. And it's just like, they're taking it hard. Most of all, Isaiah was loved for his goofy personality. He was always laughing, making everybody laugh. Yeah, that was my baby. Jaime was the only one arrested and charged with manslaughter. Castro says she believes there is more to the story and will not rest until full justice is served for everyone involved. It's he said, she said, it's, but I want the true story. There's only one story to his death. This Saturday, a basketball tournament will be held in honor of Isaiah. Castro says that the money raised at that fundraiser will go to other basketball teams and hopefully she'll have enough to create a team of her own in honor of her son, Easy. Daphne Gray, KSAT 12 News. To the latest now on the pandemic here at home, 16 more deaths now confirmed to be COVID related. Most of those deaths happened between July 21st and August 18th. We now have a total of 741 deaths in Bear County since the pandemic started. When it comes to cases, Bear County reporting 124 new COVID-19 cases. Our seven day average now at 145 cases per 24 hours. The number of hospitalizations also continues to drop 458 people hospitalized tonight and a new model predicting a continual decrease was released today. Mayor Ron Nuremberg warns this is only a prediction on hospitalization and not cases. 
a boost in pay coming to some teachers in our area. The Texas Education Agency says about $40 million will go to 26 school districts to boost teacher pay for high performing teachers. Somerset ISD, Harmony Science Academy San Antonio and La Prior ISD are on that list here in Region 20. The money was made possible after legislators passed the teacher incentive allotment last year. The night team's Petty Santos tells us why teachers in school districts will benefit. It was just life changing for many of them to, you know, some of these teachers are getting $23,000 every uh, every year for the next five years. Somerset ISD was allotted $1.7 million over the next five years to increase pay for more than a dozen high performing teachers. They were all in tears and so we had 17 teachers crying on our screen. La Prior ISD will receive about $270,000 over the next five years for three of its teachers. 49 teachers at Harmony Science Academy San Antonio will also get a raise. We saw, see a lot of our teachers um, stepping out of the classroom in order to make more money, right, by pursuing administration. And so this is a great way to keep our great teachers in the classroom. The Texas Education Agency says more than 3,600 teachers statewide will benefit from the teacher incentive allotment. The amount of money each teacher will get depends on their classification level of master, exemplary, or recognized. Rural districts and those with lower socioeconomic student status are favored. We all have been there. Like, teaching is a hard profession. It deserves to be compensated, um, you know, for the hard work and it's especially for the effectiveness. While most of the money is going directly to teachers, districts can choose where 10% of the funds allotted are used, like teacher professional development. What it does help is uh, build teacher retention in our district. The TEA says it has a team ready to walk the districts through the tedious application process. The next list of allotments will be announced next spring. You can read more about it on KSAT.com. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. First Lady Melania Trump featured during the second night of the Republican National Convention, plus an appearance from the president. A full wrap up coming up. And researchers identifying several cases of reinfection when it comes to COVID-19. Why some believe this could signal some good news. Next on the Night Beat. Now to some late breaking news on the city's northeast side. This happening on the 11,200 block of Perrin Bidal. A police sergeant there on the scene says someone was shot and has been taken to a hospital. Now officers are blocking off this area as they try to find the suspected shooter. Again, this happening on Perrin Bidal, just north of Wurzbach Parkway on the northeast side. We do have a crew there on scene trying to gather more information. We will keep you updated. Can one person catch COVID-19 twice? Until now, medical experts wondered if COVID-19 would behave like other coronaviruses and if reinfection was possible. Well, researchers in Hong Kong identified what they say is the first person to be reinfected. They say the 33-year-old man's immune system seemed to recognize the virus the second time around. According to the preprint study, the man did not show any symptoms after catching COVID-19 again, but it's not clear if this is would be true for everyone. Even though you have recovered from a natural infection, it doesn't mean that you are immunized for life uh, for that virus. Uh, and also that you can see that this virus is, is very smart because it keeps on mutating. So that means that uh, even though you have recovered from a natural infection, you still need your vaccination uh, and you still need to, to wear masks uh, and keep your social distancing. Researchers say the man only found out he was reinfected because he was traveling and had to be tested when he returned to Hong Kong. Today, doctors also announced that two European patients were reinfected with the coronavirus. Some believe it could show promising signs of a vaccine, but there's still so much to learn. A night beat update tonight on a local COVID-19 patient who has made national headlines. Carlos Muniz continues to make progress tonight. We introduced you to him earlier this month when he married his fiance from his hospital bed at Methodist Hospital. Weeks later, he was taken off an ECMO machine and put on oxygen. Now his wife Grace says Carlos has been moved to another facility, Post Acute Medical Specialty Hospital San Antonio. Grace says they might discharge her husband in a few days to begin rehab or go home with assistance. 
San Antonio police and their policies on chokeholds and no knock warrants headed to the full city council for discussion. This after District 2 Councilwoman Jada Andrew Sullivan wants to consider banning both. The Public Safety Committee considered that request today. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger reports SAPD's chief says the department has already taken action. It's a controversial move. Councilwoman Jada Andrew Sullivan wants banned outright. Mr. Eric Garner and Mr. George Floyd and Ms. Sandra Bland, LVNR is supposed to be used as a last resort. LVNR, or lateral vascular neck restraint, is how San Antonio police describe a grappling hold that reduces air or blood flow in the neck. Since 2014, SAPD has allowed the move, but only when deadly force is authorized. If your life is in danger as an officer or someone else's life is in danger, and that's the means that you have available. Using it otherwise could get an officer in administrative or criminal trouble. And the chief says no use of force complaints about choking have been sustained by a review board in the past 10 years. He believes that the current policy meets the spirit of Andrew Sullivan's request. Also up, no knock warrants like the ones used in the botched raid in Kentucky that resulted in the death of Breonna Taylor. McManus said SAPD has been using fewer of them and as of June suspended doing any more. Said SAPD is finalizing a policy to ban them outright for search warrants and allow no knock warrants only in exigent circumstances for arrests. That person we 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 learn is starting to injure people inside or or uh, maybe they set the place on fire then we would make entry without knocking. Committee members still sent both items to City Council B session for discussion. District 10's Clayton Perry voted against it, saying he's pleased with the current changes. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Look outside with live cam tonight, 88 degrees out there. Of course, everybody's still looking at the tropics, looking at what Laura's going to do and what that might mean for us here in San Antonio. Adam. Yeah, that's the big headline, of course. It's been a fairly typical weather around here, right near 100 degrees with some sunshine. And you know, over the past few days, we had a few spotty showers, but we weren't so lucky today on the radar screen. Let's get right to Laura and we'll talk about our rain chances here in the days ahead. It's obvious there's Laura right there in the central Gulf of Mexico, churning and strengthening. It is over some very warm water and that favors development along with lighter winds aloft. We don't have a whole lot of wind shear in the environment that Laura is moving into. And so that's going to favor more strengthening, likely a category two by early tomorrow morning and then a category three as we go throughout the day tomorrow. So right now, category one, max sustained winds at 90 miles per hour. We go through time and again, by tomorrow turns into a two, then a three by at least 7 p.m. tomorrow with those winds about 120 miles per hour and some higher gusts. Right now, it still looks like this is going to basically make a line here and aim right for the Texas and Louisiana state line right along the coast there. That's what we're anticipating this as a category three around midnight 1 a.m. for landfall uh, with those strong winds in excess of 120 miles per hour close to the center of that storm. Then, as usual, it quickly weakens as it moves northward, but still a category one hurricane in parts of East Texas and far western Louisiana before it further weakens, but dumps a lot of rain in parts of the mid south. So let's talk about this in terms of the spaghetti plots, the computer models. There's been a little bit of divergence recently in terms of the exact track and path, but the primary consensus is right here along the Texas Louisiana state line by very early Thursday morning or late Wednesday night, and then it's going to arc eastward. So unfortunately, it doesn't even look like we'll get any remnants of this and really no effects in terms of rainfall. You look at the forecasted path as a whole, and it's no surprise that the heaviest rain is going to be right there, right within that path. And unfortunately, too much of a good thing for some folks in Louisiana and maybe even East Texas. I mean, we're talking over seven inches of rain around the Lake Charles area, and then the, the actual rainfall and the gradient in the rain is very steep. It, the rainfall rates fall off really quickly. Even as you get to Houston, maybe an inch or two, San Antonio, it doesn't bode too well for us, does it? Not this time around. Actually, I have an isolated rain chance of 30%. 
chance in the forecast the next few days, and most of that's not even related to Laura. So let's look at our future cast. In this particular model, I like how it handles the day tomorrow. Partly cloudy, some showers developing east of town. They'll be widely separated and broken apart, and not all that numerous, so not a whole lot of coverage. But those of you in Hallettsville, Lavaca County, DeWitt County, Victoria counties, you have better odds of seeing those isolated showers. And then a quiet night around here tomorrow night, and then we get into Thursday afternoon, and it's just your typical little pop-up random isolated shower activity that we would see around here into Thursday afternoon, similar to what we saw the past couple of days. So high temperature today, 100. Let's talk temps. That's just two degrees shy of the record for today and four degrees above average. But we're already down in the 70s in some areas. Rio Medina 76, Bulverde now 79. We're 78 in Tarpley, 86 though in Divine. And officially at the airport in town, we're at 88. And Del Rio still hanging on to the 90s at 94. Tomorrow morning, we'll wake up to 76. A lot of sunshine. Then those patchy clouds into the afternoon and that 30% chance. So a few isolated showers. Not a lot of coverage in terms of uh, our real estate around South Texas. Same story as we go into Thursday. Generally, right near 100. Partly cloudy. More of the same with a few shots here and there at some pop up showers. All right, just a few chances. Thanks, Adam. All right, Craig, some breaking news regarding the high school football season set to begin on Friday. Right, right. It's coming up this week. We believe this is the first cancellation due to the COVID-19 pandemic of the week of the first part of this season. It is in Kennedy, Texas, not Kennedy High School, Kennedy, Texas, where they had a third coach test positive for the coronavirus announced on their Facebook page tonight. That brings to three coaches, one player. So they decided to call off their game against Carn City. Carn City instead has now decided to play Marion Saturday at seven in Carn City. But this is just now breaking news. When we come back, more about that. Also, it looks like Xavier Woods, Woods has heard this before when it comes to another new safety coming to town. And our are the Quarrel Gobblers ready to kick off the season with our game of the week coming up? The Dallas Cowboys will pass on free agent safety Earl Thomas, despite the fact that former Longhorn has pleaded with the Cowboys to come get him in the past. That's according to two separate reports today, including one from the NFL Network. But if that's the case, it's news to Jerry Jones, who had this reaction on his weekly radio show in Dallas. He doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> he has no idea what he's talking about. Okay, the only one that knows that is me standing right here. So we know the player. Uh, we've got a good read. Everybody in the league does when I played last year. So you know where he is uh, skill-wise uh, and uh, uh, where he is at this part of his career. All of those go into consideration. Uh, we'll have a, uh, a, a, a lot of things to put in the hopper, and then I'll make the decision. You know, this is all catching the ear of Xavier Woods, who's about to start the final season of his rookie contract as safety. Last year, he had two interceptions, which may not be a lot, but did tie for the team lead. And remember, he had to tolerate his this all this talk first from Thomas, of course, back in 2018, again in 2019. More recently, Jamal Adams, who wound up being traded to Seattle. Now it's Thomas again, but it hasn't shaken the former six-round draft pick's confidence at all. That's the bottom line. Uh, I know my I know my work. I know that uh, I can play, and that's all that matters to me. It doesn't it doesn't bother me anymore, man. I don't even pay no mind to it. And the Los Angeles Rams have announced they will not have fans at home games when they kick off their season against the Dallas Cowboys next month. But the Cowboys owner does intend to have fans in the stands in Arlington, albeit a limited amount. Even though he did say today there will be no fans for this Saturday's blue-white scrimmage. As the Houston Texans continue their training camp, prepare for opening day on September the 10th, they are keeping one eye on the coast. That's because Hurricane Laura is bearing down on the Gulf Coast with Houston inside the cone of where it might hit on Thursday. Remember, it wasn't that long ago Hurricane Harvey caused widespread devastation in 2017. This is like typical for 2020, right? You got, you got all these things going on, and now you got a hurricane. I mean, it is what it is. You just, you just adjust, you adapt. You know, this is what it is, and if we get a hurricane, it's terrible, but we just adjust our schedule, and, and these guys, you know, we'll have the team ready to go. Have the UTSA Roadrunners named a starting quarterback yet? Next. 
It appears that new UTSA head coach Jeff Taylor knows who his starting quarterback will be for the coming 2020 season. He's just choosing right now to keep it to himself. There's been a four-way competition for the position since fall camp began between Frank Harris, Lowell Narcisse, Jordan Weeks, and New Mexico State transfer and former Smithson Valley Ranger Josh Atkins, with the first three having starting time last year under Frank Wilson. When asked today, Taylor says his depth chart is set. He just doesn't see any reason to release it now. Today, we also found out that not a single member of the Roadrunners football team made the Conference USA preseason team. If I was a player, it would definitely motivate me that no one in the conference thought we had anybody on our squad worthy of being mentioned. So I have to ask the fellas uh, how they feel about it. I would imagine it wouldn't make me feel real good if I was a player. And uh, that's probably how they'll look at it as well. And the Roadrunners will kick out their season two weeks from this Saturday on the road in San Marcos against Texas State. The big game and a big game coverage this Friday will feature the number six Lavernia Bears, the new sub 5A 12's top 12 hosting the number nine Quero Gobblers. We visited with the Bears on Monday. Now today we made our trip, an hour and a half trip, drive down to Quero to check in with the Gobblers before they help us kick off the 2020 season this week. Quero also plays in 4A, but a division two where they're expected to make a run for the district 13 4A title with as many as 18 starters returning on a team that is ranked in the top 20 in the state, according to Texas Football Magazine. Right now, they're just ready to get this season going. We've always played them uh, lower levels, lower grades, and we're looking to play them again and uh, do good, show out. I think it'll be a good football game. Uh, you know, the Barnier, they got a good, they got a great history. They have a good football team. Uh, they got that quarterback, they got a quarterback returning, a big receiver. Uh, we think it'll be a big challenge for us, but uh, I mean, heck, everything's new right now, so uh, let's go. Right about that. Kickoff between the Gobblers and the Bears in Lavernia this Friday night, set for 7.30. Be there live to get you ready for the big game and our big game coverage at 5. Lucas Giolito of the Chicago White Sox threw a no-hitter tonight in Major League Baseball. It's the first of the COVID-19 shortened season and the first in the Major League, his Major League career. He came against the Pittsburgh Pirates tonight, where the 26-year-old struck out 13 with his low mistake, a fourth inning walk to the Pirates shortstop Eric Gonzalez. The White Sox last was... Philip Humber's perfect game in 2012. Getting back to our breaking story, Kennedy, that's Kennedy, Texas, canceling their game against Carn City for this Saturday at 7 because of a third positive test of one of their coaches. They also have a player who tested positive. Carn City will now play Marion in Carn City Saturday at 7. We believe this is the first cancellation statewide of a game the week of week one. Let's hope there's no more. Exactly. Thanks, Greg. Right. Thanks, Greg. Tonight's theme, Land of Opportunity. For night two of the Republican National Convention, the highlights just ahead. And a downward trend in hospitalization continues here locally, but this pandemic far from over. A discussion with local emergency room Dr. Robert Frolickstein coming up next in our KSAC Q&A. We are seeing our numbers improve locally when it comes to COVID-19. For today's KSAT Q&A, we want to bring in an expert we have relied on throughout this pandemic for information. Dr. Robert Frolickstein, a local emergency room physician with Methodist Healthcare. Doctor, good to see you as always. Thanks for being with us. Let's talk first about what you're seeing right now in the hospital. You know, it's uh, pretty encouraging lately. I think right now, there are about half as many admitted patients in the San Antonio area as, as we saw one month ago. Um, but that's still four, five, almost 500 patients admitted to the hospital in San Antonio with COVID. So it's encouraging that we're seeing decreases, but it's, it's still out there. I'm still seeing patients in the emergency department with COVID, not as frequently. Uh, but importantly, just as sick as they were. The severity of illness is not really changing at all, just the frequency. And that certainly seems to follow, Doctor, the SG2 model that was released by the city today in their daily briefing showing that it accurately predicted the spike that we saw in June and July. And it's now predicting that we should continue to see the numbers go down, at least the hospitalization numbers, if we continue doing what we're doing into September. What are your concerns uh, when it comes to the models as far as maybe providing a, a false sense of security for folks out there? You know, I, I kind of feel like where we were in, it feels the same as we, as mid to late May, right? Where we felt like we maybe had a handle on things and then Memorial Day hit and things took off. So I, I have the same concern with uh, uh, Labor Day coming up and back to school. And will I, I'm concerned, I think 
frankly, I think we'd be naive to think we won't see a resurgence um, probably around the 1st of October, somewhere around there. We just hopefully it will not be as severe as what we saw uh, this summer. Let's talk about back to school. We know the majority of local schools have not returned to in-person learning. Everything is online for the most part right now. Are hospitals preparing in any way for uh, potentially more pediatric patients once in-person learning resumes? Sure, um, abs absolutely. I think, uh, you know, this is also the time we start seeing RSV and it will be a few months from now it'll be the flu and so there are definitely plans to be able to um, care for normal illnesses we see in addition to the COVID. Since you just touched on the flu let's talk about that how important I mean it's always important to get the flu vaccine how important is it this year with the coronavirus out there and do you expect that it will be harder to get the flu vaccine this year and when would be a good time to get it should you get it earlier or about the same time that you normally would yeah I don't think it's going to be harder to get it in fact I think they're making uh, more doses than than usual um, and I think the timing is it's always a little um, variable i guess but probably anytime in september maybe towards the later part of september is when to start getting the vaccine and the reason i think it's so important is that uh, if people don't get the flu vaccine then we're setting ourselves up for a pandemic of flu in addition to the pandemic of covid the way vaccines work you know there's all people always say oh it's only 60 percent since they are 60 percent effective why should i get it it's, i still might get the flu well that's true but if if it's 60 percent effective then that means uh instead of one person having the flu spreading it to two or three they may only spread it to one and that's how you control a pandemic is decreasing the amount of spread and so i think it's very very important to get the the flu vaccine this year you yourself are a frontline worker. We have talked to you here about one of your big concerns uh, several weeks ago when we were really at the height of this was whether local health care workers were going to be able con to continue keeping up the stamina that you all have had to have had uh, over these last couple of months. How are your colleagues doing right now? How are our health care workers faring at this point? You know, I, amazingly well. Um, I mean, I could be more proud of my, our team. Um, people have are still coming in with a great attitude and and uh, you know I think the overall though we feel pretty safe in the emergency department with our the protective gear we have and the processes in place uh, so I don't think that fear is there anymore but it's still grueling it's still hard to see people this ill with this virus uh, so we just got to stick with it all right, Dr. Robert Froelichstein, thanks as always for being with us. We'll surely be talking to you again soon. Take care. Hey, thank you very much. We'll be right back. First Lady Melania Trump headlining the Republican National Convention tonight, along with other members of the Trump family and GOP namesakes. Some of the night drawing outrage, though, from some Democrats and government watchdogs as Secretary of State Mike Pompeo delivered his remarks from Jerusalem. Never before in modern American history has the nation's sitting top diplomat spoken at a political convention for either party. ABC's Andrew Dimbert reports on night two of the Republican National Convention. At the Republican National Convention, it was First Lady Melania Trump's turn to step into the political spotlight. Speaking from the White House Rose Garden, she helped renovate. We have not forgotten the incredible people who were willing to take a chance on the businessmen who had never worked in politics. Her speech championing confidence in her husband and the American dream. He's not a traditional politician. He doesn't just speak words. He demands action and he gets results. Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky also headlining night two of the RNC. But in an unprecedented address, America's top diplomat, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, speaking to the convention from Israel. I have a big job as Susan's husband and Nick's dad. Susan and Nick are more safe and their freedoms more secure because President Trump has put his America First vision into action. 
Pompeo is the first sitting Secretary of State in modern times to deliver a speech at a party's political convention. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi accusing Republicans of blurring the line between politics and public service. This is the wrong way to go. For Republicans, day two's theme may have been America land of opportunity, but the convention's tone was set on day one, with GOP speakers echoing grievances against the Democratic Party and a potential Biden presidency. Don't let them destroy your families, your lives and your future. Don't let them kill future generations because they told you and brainwashed you and fed you lies that you weren't good enough. Not all was an affront to the Democratic Party, though. Two of the highest profile speakers on opening night were Republicans of color. Former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley and South Carolina Senator Tim Scott telling their personal stories. Our family went from cotton to Congress in one lifetime. And that's why I believe the next American century can be better than the last. Now there was one speaker, Marianne Mendoza, who was dropped from the lineup after sharing anti-Semitic conspiracy theories on Twitter. Mendoza is a member of the Trump campaign advisory board. Andrew Dimbert, ABC News, Washington. When it comes to the coronavirus, the numbers of newly confirmed COVID-19 cases and deaths in the U.S. are down compared to last week. Just five states are currently in an upward trajectory with that, plus a legal victory in Florida for teachers. ABC's Romina Puga with the latest. COVID hospitalizations are going down in the U.S., with Monday recording the lowest death toll since mid-July. This positive news following President Trump's announcement that the FDA issued an emergency authorization for convalescent plasma to be used as treatment for COVID-19 patients. But today, FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn is facing criticism. He apologized for overstating the life-saving benefits, tweeting, what I should have said is that the data shows a relative risk reduction, not an absolute risk reduction. And more cases are being traced to super spreader events, like the biotech conference in Boston in February. Fewer than 200 people attended the event, but a new study shows it may have led to nearly 20,000 infections in the Boston area alone. And at least 103 cases in eight states are now linked to the Sturgis motorcycle rally. Meanwhile, the back to school battle continues. I, I can't put my family at risk. A Florida judge sided with teachers ruling against a state executive order that would force educators back into the classroom, instead letting them work remotely during the pandemic if they choose without the threat of losing state funding. College campuses across the country still struggling with climbing cases. The University of Notre Dame has over 470 cases. Julie Randall and seven of her roommates have all tested positive. We really try to adhere to the standards that Notre Dame set. Yeah, there's eight of us and who knows <laughs> where one of us got it. And a new study shows why wearing your mask below your nose leaves you more vulnerable. The virus appeared to uh, pick the nose as a fertile ground for infection. A group of 43 researchers at the University of North Carolina mapped locations in the respiratory tract to see where COVID-19 is most likely to infiltrate the body. They found the cells in the nose may be more likely to get infected than the throat or lungs. In Colorado, Romina Puga, ABC News. One in five adults in the U.S. experiences mental illness each year. And with the coronavirus pandemic creating unprecedented challenges in all of our daily lives, it's important to know what resources are available for those wanting help. It's why KSAT is joining our community partners for a crucial discussion on mental health. Tomorrow, join us for a virtual town hall from 2 to 3 p.m. From COVID-19 to job loss, homeschooling, and general fear of the unknown, our panel of doctors and mental health experts will be ready to answer your questions. And you can submit those questions online right now at ksat.com community. You can watch tomorrow's event on ksat.com or through our ksat TV app, however you stream. Take another live look outside with live cam on this Tuesday evening. Things pretty quiet out there, but way off to the east and out into the Gulf. We're keeping a close eye on Laura. Yeah, Hurricane Laura right now a category one hurricane likely to become a category two as we go through the night into early tomorrow morning. So let's get right to it. Take a look at the latest information that we get from the Hurricane Center and the max sustained winds are at 
90 miles per hour with some gusts up to 115 and that central pressure of 978 millibars that's going to drop and that's the intensification of this storm and in turn also winds will be getting stronger as well and it's moving to the west northwest at 17 miles per hour so that should put it then as it starts to curve northward right near the texas louisiana state line OK, we're talking right there along the coastline as a category three storm by late tomorrow night, almost this time tomorrow night, late tomorrow night and into very early Thursday morning. So most likely east of Galveston, closer to the Lake Charles area and the strongest and the highest storm surge will be on the right hand side of this path, even outside of that cone. We're still going to have some big impacts from this storm because the actual reach of it is far greater than that cone of uncertainty, which is basically for that center of circulation. Then as it heads due north, it dissipates and will be dumping a lot of rainfall. But in terms of the wind, let's talk about it in terms of where the highest winds should be. The yellow indicates some low end tropical storm force winds, 40 to 55 miles per hour. The orange higher end tropical storm force and the red, the hurricane force winds, which will be right there along the state line along the coast and in the Lake Charles, Louisiana area by late tomorrow night and early on Thursday morning. So that's where the winds should really be confined within this storm. That's the latest data we have from the computer models. As for rainfall, it'll be a big rainmaker. These systems often are and this one. At least it's progressive and it's moving, so it's not going to sit in one spot. Nonetheless, five to seven inches of rainfall for a good portion of far east Texas and western Louisiana and where it makes landfall, probably over seven inches of rain. But then those rainfall totals fall off very quickly the farther away you go from the center of that storm and around here, maybe an isolated shower to the next couple of days. So a 30 percent chance Wednesday and Thursday and a 20 percent chance of an isolated shower on Friday. So not not good coverage across our area in terms of rain. 86 right now. High temperatures today. We were at the century mark briefly. Del Rio was 101 and Catula 102. Tomorrow morning we'll wake up to readings mostly in the mid 70s. Then by the afternoon back up to right near 100 degrees for the high temperature. We're thinking 103 Del Rio Eagle Pass 102. Those will be the hot spots. 98 in San Antonio, New Braunfels, Gonzales at 98 along with Lavernia and Bernie about 95. Then we look ahead in terms of the shower chances, as I mentioned, just that 30% chance tomorrow, the next couple of days. Otherwise, it's really more of the same for us. You know, despite a major hurricane likely to make landfall near Texas, Louisiana state line, and for us, it's just more of the same, partly cloudy, and here and there, we'll have a few of those pop up showers. All right, thank you, Adam. Have you heard of pink slime websites and the trouble they pose amid the presidential election and what you need to look for? next in our KSAT Trust Index.